Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming and joining us tonight uh, for yet another letter that we're going to be learning about, another Hebrew letter. And I'm just going to open up in prayer and get us started that way. So, Lord, we just thank you for your presence. We thank you, Lord, that you are ever present with us, Lord, that even though we're all in our own separate homes right now, um, we are able to come together and fellowship with you in the spirit, Lord, that where two or more are gathered, you are there in the midst of us. So we just invite your presence to be with us. We just ask that your Holy Spirit would come, give us ears to hear, a heart of understanding, open our minds to be able to receive the fullness of your word that you have for us today. And Father, we just thank you that you would just help us to get understanding of your word. Show us what it is to be a disciple of Yeshua. Show us what it is to walk with you and to be in, in the yoke with the Lord and be able to be led by the Spirit and what it is to actually carry out your word in a practical way, Lord. We just ask that you would just be um, able to impart that understanding to us tonight in, in the way that each one of us can grasp it. So we thank you for your presence. We thank you for each individual person that's listening, and I just pray, Lord, that you would just give a blessing to each one of them, that uh, your your fire of God would rest upon their household, and even as they're hearing these words, Lord, that it would just refresh their soul. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, this is going to be the letter Lamet. And this letter is about discipleship. This is going to be a lot about your spiritual life and your spiritual destiny. And it reflects on the role of the Good Shepherd in our lives by means of the Torah. And so we're going to go into it right away. And so we'll go to slide two. So the letter Lamed, it's the 12th letter. So we've reached the middle of the Hebrew alphabet at this point, just a little ways past the, Hebrew, the, the middle of the alphabet. So this is the 12th letter, and it has a numerical value of 30. And it pictures an ox goat, something called a malmud in Hebrew. And it has like a little pointy, you know, end there. And this is what they would use to um, work with the oxen when they're plowing fields and different things like that when they're shepherding. I had a, a different roles, but um, that's sort of like a spear, almost kind of looking instrument. And it's also kind of a picture of a, a staff. And sometimes they would even use this for war. So it's pictures an ox goat. It has the sound of l as in lamb, the so lamid. And it has a symbolic meaning of study, uh, learning, the learning process itself and prodding, so you would use this to prod the cattle or to uh, shepherd the sheep, and you're moving them towards the goal, and that would be the, the point of this letter, is to st you're at a destination that you need to come to, and there's a process getting there. The literal meaning is staff, rod, cattle goad, and it's the largest letter of the alphabet, it reaches above all the other letters, and it's also the center letter of the alphabet. So it's the tallest. It's, it's above all of the letters, and there's a, there's a spiritual meaning in that that we'll come to. It's the first letter in the word for heart, which is lev. And so I have a picture of a heart there, and the heart kind of looks a bit like the lamed being like if you were thinking about your back or your spine and what's happening inside your body where your heart's positioned, it kind of is like the shape of a lamed. If you were to take two lamids and put them side by side facing each other, it would look like a heart on a string, which is very interesting because when this letter shows up in a double form side by side in words, it's often in relation to raising of a hands up to the heavens in praise or in prayer, um, and it's a reflection of the heart coming out of a person through their hands, being lifted up to the Lord. So we'll go to, oh yeah, and Lamed represents the journey of the heart in the, in the coming, sorry, the journey of the heart and the mind in coming together as one. So the goal of learning is bringing your mind and your heart together into one place where you can discern from. 
and function from, make decisions from. And it's, it says in uh, Jewish tradition that this is the greatest distance that a person can travel in the earth. The greatest distance for you to ever travel is the distance between your heart and your mind. Um, because oftentimes we're very fragmented in how we function as people and our heart and our mind are not functioning in sync. And so we strive and that's instead of resting. And so when we bring our heart and our mind together in peace, perfect peace, um, our heart and our mind function in sync and we're not like a double minded person or someone tossed to and fro, um, is the idea. So we'll move to the next slide. Slide number three, there's three letters that represent this word Lamed, and it's the root verb Lamad, so Lamed or Lamad. They're very similar sounding, same letters to spell them, just a slight difference in how it's pronounced. So this verbal root Lamed is also the root verb for the noun Tamid, which is the word for disciple or student. And so this is the connection with the Lamed right away is it's disciple, student, and the process of learning, how a disciple learns. So we're going to be learning about the posture of learning and the way for us to be even be thinking about how to learn um, God's instructions and be able to tune our ears to hear the shepherd's voice. So this is a word, Lamad, is a verb that means to learn, literally. It implies disciplined learning. So there's a few words that relate to this word as well. I didn't want to give you too much on that. Um, but it, what it presents is the function of the ox goad is about prodding the cattle towards a goal or a specific outcome. And this is how God disciples us and how Yeshua is discipling us through his word, through his instructions, is and through his father's instructions, is getting us from one place, which is um, a baby, so to speak, a spiritual baby, into spiritual maturity as a son, a mature son or mature daughter in the Lord. And the goal is fruitfulness. That's what we're producing fruit for the father, for the father to be glorified. And that's what proves that we are Yeshua's disciples, and that's in John 15. So this is suggesting the aspect of discipline, the way that the ox goat functions in farming and and that kind of kind of part of life. Um, it's picturing discipline and guidance, and it, within that is a labor productivity principle because we talked last week about productivity and producing, and this is a, a connection of these letters together. Um, it's implying the labor the effort on our part in the learning process, that we're going to engage ourselves with uh, an intention to produce something, to come to a goal, and to arrive at a certain destination. And so it, it requires a certain level of diligence. And diligence in Hebrew means decision-making, um, intentional decision-making that results in that goal. So Lamed is going to teach us about Torah study, the purpose of the Torah study. And why is it important? Why do I keep using this word Torah, right? You know, maybe it's it's getting a little frustrating for people when they keep hearing that. Why don't I just say the word of God, for instance? Um, why am I using this word Torah, which I'll explain. So there's a three-letter root inside the word for disciple, which is Tamid, and, or Tamid, and it's, um, I've got in the slide there where it's in red. And then there's two other letters in blue, and I did this intentionally to show you the root verb that's in there, and then the, the two letters that aren't used in that root are the, the letters Tav and the letters Yod. We've learned Yod. We haven't learned Tav yet. But basically, what it's showing you is that to learn, that's the root verb in there, but the other two letters are telling you you're learning the Torah, the Tav, that represents the word Torah and the word truth, the concept of truth, it's the seal of truth, and the letter Yod, which is like the idea of your hand um, being put to the plow and putting your hand to effort in your spiritual life, coming into the spirit, the role of the spirit in your life, 
And it represents the word yada, which is the word no. And so it's about knowing the truth. So even the letters that are used in that root verb are also combined in how this whole word functions all together. It's about the disciple is learning to know the truth of God in order to apply it. And as a result, they're able to move forward. They're going towards something. And the plural form of tamid is is tamadim. And so this is the word disciple in Hebrew. In the classroom, we are called tamadim, or pupils, for instance, um, in the Greek, in the Greek version of this passage, if when you see it in the book of Matthew, for instance. Um, the Greek word means exactly the same thing. It means pupil, student, scholar. So in the sense that we're all students, we're scholars, what we're learning is the covenant. That's what, what our skill set that we're gaining. We're going to school, the school of Yeshua, um, and we're learning about salvation and the process of working out our salvation in order to produce fruit to be pleasing to God, uh, because our faith, you know, without faith, you can't please God, it says. So we're growing our faith into a place where our faith is actually what's producing the fruit. Our faith is actually um, becoming an extension of God himself, producing the life of, of the Spirit, wherever we go. So that's what the goal of being a student is. So we're going into the classroom, and the classroom is the field, it's the world, it's the universe. We're going into our place of wherever it is our influence is, wherever we're, our assignments are, our responsibilities, our families, um, whatever it looks like for each individual person, that's your field. And that's the shepherd's field. You're a sheep in the shepherd's field in the world. And so that's your first education center, is learning in the practical what it is to walk out uh, the spiritual in order to um, grow in love. That's the goal, is that you would become a scholar of the covenant. And when we say scholar of the covenant, we're talking about being excellent at love. That's the goal. So this is what the shepherd is teaching us. He's teaching us what it is to obey his instructions, which starts with us loving him, demonstrating our love for him, and then as a result of us loving him, we get understanding as to what it looks like to love others in the world and everyone around us in the body of Christ and so on. So this is us. We're being instructed in the Hebrew language. So right now you are a Tamadim. You are being discipled in the Hebrew language. You're learning how to become taught. So there's a receiving aspect. You have to eat. You're being Food is being put before you at the table and you're partaking. You're receiving it. You're eating it and digesting it. And so the purpose of our posture or the goal of our posture when we're learning and when we're being a disciple. So when we call ourselves disciples of Yeshua, because we hear this word a lot, we're all like, yes, I'm a disciple of the Lord. But what does it mean? What is it? What's the action? The function of a disciple is listening, hearing, and being teachable. And this is the beginning of humility working its way out in us. And this word bitul, is always combined with the word humility because Beetle means um, shedding your ego, dying to yourself. But in order to really truly humble yourself, you've got to let something roll off your back. You've got to die to your ego. You've got to let your ego go. You've got to shed that skin, that flesh, and take on the body of Messiah, what is called the soul of the Messiah. And think like he thinks and process like he processes. So you being a disciple is about you learning how Yeshua thinks. Yeshua is teaching you how the Father thinks. And Yeshua is bringing your heart and the Father's heart together under his headship, the mind of Christ, that causes now all of us to be in fellowship together. 
and walking out truth in the world so that people experience light. And that's how all these pieces fit together. So we're disciples of Yeshua. He's our teacher. And the word rabbi means teacher. So they would call him Rabbi Yeshua. And this letter is teaching us about how to become a student, how to posture ourselves as a student of the Father's love in this world. We'll move to the next slide. The numerical value of the letter Lamed is 30. And so this is where it connects to Jesus immediately when he's now reaching the age of 30. He's becoming, he's, he's stepping into his role as a rabbi. And he's choosing disciples. He's choosing what his, who his students are going to be, who he's going to send out, who's going to raise up, who's going to now um, become uh, an imitation of him, not an imitation in the sense of a mimicking imitation, but teaching the truths um, that he's imparting to them. You have to create generations of truth. Um, and so he's choosing his son. Um, the sons of Israel, so to speak. It's like when God, cho- when Abraham um, was told by the Lord that he would have 12 uh, offspring or that would come out of him, right? That would produce seed. And so the 12 tribes came forth. And so Jesus is picking his 12 disciples in the same way as the 12 tribes came forth. And this is the spiritual seed. And so this number 30 is represented in him coming into the fullness of his stature as a man, stepping into his career as a rabbi, and choosing his 12 disciples. So it's the 12th letter represents 12, and then also numerical value of 30. So there's a link that's here, and he's selecting 12 men. And then there's a story we read in Luke chapter 2, I believe, that says that Jesus is at the age of 12. Now he's reached the age where he is being taken on the pilgrim journey with his father to go to the temple for the feast um, that they were required to go to the temple for. And so you read the story in Luke where Jesus is 12 years old, sitting in the temple, having conversation with the teachers there, and he is baffling them because he knew the sod level of scripture. He knew all of the levels of the scriptures, which is multiple levels there. Different prophets teach different levels. Uh, John the Beloved teaches the sod level, which is the idea of, um, it's very uh, picturesque. Like the book of Revelation is describing a lot of symbolic things. That would be the stoves level. So Jesus knew every layer of the scriptures because they, they're talking about him. And so he was teaching them in the temple. And so we see this emerge. And so this is the pattern of the letter. The Lamed is, is expressing itself in the story of the Gospels. We'll move to the next slide. So when I'm talking about Torah. I talk a lot about Torah. Why do I say this word Torah a lot? Um, Why don't I just say the Word of God? And the reason why is because I'm provoking it with intent. Because using the word Word of God is something we hear all the time. We're used to that term. Um, We, without realizing it, we we've already programmed our mind as to our response to that phrase, the word of God, the word of God. And it can be very passive for our engagement when it comes to it. So I'm using a word that makes people uncomfortable when I'm using the word Torah, because that's the word Jesus would use. Um, When Jesus returns, he is going to be the king of the earth. This is literally going to happen. Um, It seems like it's something that's never going to happen in our lifetime. It's just part of a spiritual story that we tell ourselves and we tell our children and we We tell each other and we take fellowship with each other, but this is something that's really going to happen. He's going to really actually be the king at some point. We're going to step into that time. And he's going to be using these terms. And if it happens in our lifetime, I'm getting you used to this word because this is this you want to be able to understand when this word is being used. Um, He's not going to be talking about the word of God the same way we would necessarily. Um, So, Torah is just talking about the Father's instructions. 
in regard to these arrows. He's sending these arrows toward our heart to penetrate our heart with himself with the knowledge of himself, with the understanding of himself, with the wisdom of himself, in order to put that arrow in our heart and pull us toward him. And this is for the purpose of us finishing well. And I want you to be able to differentiate between this passive idea of the Word of God just being just, you know, we we use that term, Word of God, But the Torah is specific to instructions. There's something we're supposed to participate in. It's not something we're just to hear, recite, and and it's just a part of an emotional reaction that we have in life or something we use to stabilize stabilize ourselves when we have an emotional moment or, you know, we we have a crisis and so we need the Word of God. This This is the eating and partaking of the Word all the time, the Father's instructions in our life every single day, every single moment of the day. That's just the idea of the word Torah, is that he's ever-present. He's always instructing, and you're tuning your ear to hear. Um, And so the idea is that out a lot there now in the world, when we're talking about the Christian, um, the world as far as in the Christian uh, side of things, um, we're talking a lot about revelation and people's personal revelation. Instead of talking about the Word of God and aligning revelation with the Word of God. And so that's why I differentiate between the Word of God, because Word of God now means to a lot of people just revelation. And revelation, it's not necessarily the Word of God. It might be flesh. And there's a lot of flesh out there now, and and a lot of us are having a hard time trying to sift through all of that and find that truth so we can walk in freedom and have peace. So that's why I use the word Torah a lot. It's just to get you used to it. We're told to provoke the Jews to jealousy. That's what it says in Romans 9, uh, Romans 11. And the goal of the Gentiles, we're Gentiles, the goal of our lives should be to become so well trained in the scriptures that we provoke the Jews to jealousy. That's what it says. And and this is God's desire, because this is what's going to turn uh, things around at the end days, is when the Jews come to the place where they're provoked to jealousy by the Gentiles, it means that we're at that time. We're at the time of the final redemption where the Messiah is going to come, he's going to rebuild the earth, he's going to set himself up as king. And that's what they're waiting for. And so if we learn the scriptures, we can explain the scriptures. And we want to be like Jesus at the temple when he's 12 years old and he's educating the people of that time about the times and the seasons that were unfolding before them. And he's, he's talking about himself in the scriptures. He's able to teach that to, to them at 12 years old. We want to have the maturity of the spirit because the spirit within us is mature and is ever thinking about that moment. The spirit inside of us, the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of holiness, is always awaiting the moment when Yeshua returns and sets out his kingdom for the literal side. Uh, Not just the spiritual kingdom ruling in our hearts, but the literal kingdom of God that's for a thousand years. It's going to happen at some point. It might happen in our lifetime. We should expect it to be so. So that's the goal. So when I'm talking about the Torah, in this letter in Lamed, this letter in Lamed is even in the shape of a mountaintop type of experience, and I have that image there for you, is this guy standing on a ledge, um, and it looks like the letter, like even in the letter, that the letter is like the head of a person standing on a ledge, because the learning process in Scripture is referred to as a mountain, the mountain of the Lord, Mount Zion. Um, these are terms, even the altar is called um, Har-El, which is the mountain of God, and Ariel, which is the lion of God. And that's the altar of sacrifice. And so there's a concept very deep in Scripture that makes up one-third of the Torah that relates to the posture of the heart in worship, which is something called a Vuda, the, the act of service towards God. Um, and the process of this is it relates to our prayer life, it relates to how we take in the scriptures, how we digest them, and how we disciple. All of that is a part of our worship. It's all a part of how we function every single day as believers and how we're imparting the Spirit of God uh, to others in everything that we're touching in the practical. 
So we want to come into these mountaintop experiences. We want to actually live uh, in the ascending and descending of these mountaintop experiences. And I'm not talking about something emotional or something of a spiritual hype. I'm talking about something very practical that happens in your soul where you've disciplined yourself to the degree that in your soul, your soul becomes the place of learning and you live on the mountain of God. And that's what Paul's trying to express in Romans 12, talking about the altar of sacrifice, when he's saying that it's your reasonable service, this is your spiritual service to God, is to put yourself on the altar daily. And so this is also the altar again. Mispach is, is, the, is another name for it is Harel, which is mountain of God. So the word mountain, you hear these stories or read these stories in the Gospels of Jesus going up the mountain and then coming down the mountain. And you'll see in relation to those experiences, he's either teaching just before or teaching just after. And that's because it's always related to learning. So Lamed is the picture of you in that journey. It's you going through the valley, climbing up the mountain, taking the journey up. You know, all the effort it takes to climb a mountain and to, you know, do the, 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 um, the outdoorsy type thing. If you're an outdoorsy type person, you know, like this, you might love this. Um, if you're not, then you won't appreciate this at all. Uh, but the whole idea of climbing up the mountain is you got to find that path. Sometimes those paths are very narrow. They're very steep. They're full of debris. Um, and this is our life. In, in our spiritual life when we're walking it out. It's not always this picture-perfect uh, thing we imagine and sometimes romanticize. But the reality is, is that we're going through this narrow path up a mountain, and there's points in this path that it's very steep and there's a lot of labor. There's, it, it, it's taking your energy. It's taking your time. It's, there's so much effort involved at, at points within that journey. But once you get up to this top, this ledge, when you're looking from the high place, um, the, you're at this higher, higher level, this higher altitude, and you're able to see something very different than what you see when you're looking at something on a 2D level, when it's just right in front of you. You're seeing things from a, a multidimensional level. And this is what the process of learning is, is to get us to a place where you can see from your spirit on a multidimensional level from heaven in the sense of not like literally from heaven, but understanding how God's perspective is working in the earth. So you're seeing from a higher place. You're not looking at what's right in front of you and reacting in the flesh, reacting out of emotions or reacting out of the moment. Instead, you're able to understand all the layers that are actually unraveling before you so that you can see the blueprint that God's unfolding for you to step into and speak the word. Um, and this is how Jesus functions. This is how he taught the disciples to function so that they would know at the appropriate time what word to speak in order to bring the deliverance that was necessary, to bring the healing that was necessary, to bring the restoration and the resurrection life and the, the repair that was necessary for the moment. Um, and that includes encouragement, that includes discipline, that includes correction. All those aspects of discipling are included in that. You have to see from up high. And one of the, the things that the Bible uses as an illustration of this is ego eyes. Um, the, the eagle is the enemy to the snake, but the snake is the enemy to the eagle. And when the eagle is soaring, it can swoop down and grab the snake with its talons lift the snake up to a high place, drop the snake from the horizon, and the snake explodes. And that's a picture of spiritual warfare. And when the, the uh, eagle is on the ground, when his feet are on the ground, the snake becomes his enemy because the, the venom of the snake can come up and sneak up because he he's not seeing from the high altitude. He's on the ground now. He's on the level. And so he can't see it sneak up, uh, and he can get bit. And so this is the picture of our lives functioning, is we are always in this journey where there's mountaintops, there's valleys, there's paths, 
there's uh, sometimes we're forging the path as a forerunner. Sometimes the path is already forged and we're running. Uh, sometimes we're walking. Sometimes we're sitting. This is the process. Sometimes we need to rest and sometimes we need to labor. Um, you know, Ecclesiastes 3 is like there's a time for this and a time for that. Um, this is our journey. This is our, our discipleship journey when Jesus is teaching us and training us in love. There's all these aspects. It's multidimensional. We need a multidimensional perspective. Uh, that's maturity, to have complete understanding. And the word understanding in Hebrew means discernment, and discernment means understanding. So when we're learning, we're getting understanding. When we're getting understanding, we're growing in our ability to discern, and discern is about dividing between what is good and not good, what is true and not true, what is a, a false report and what's a true report, how to make good judgments and right judgments and what's a false judgment, um, and so on and so forth. We want to be able to put our finger on the right thing and not judge in a false way. We want to do right judgment, righteous judgment, but sometimes our righteous judgment can even be con condemning because we don't understand the situation. We haven't come up high to navigate what compassion, kindness, patience, uh, peace, all the fruit of the Spirit is necessary in that moment to bring repentance. And repentance is the idea of returning back to something um, and leaving something behind. So whenever we're being kind, we are provoking people to either be kind and inspiring them to be kind, or by us being hostile, we're turning off their desire to be kind. Um, and it works like that with all of the fruit of spirit, because, you know, the flesh is opposite to the way their spirit expresses itself. Um, and so we're always trying to grow in the measure of what we're carrying as fruit and increasing it in maturity, right? So when we're, when we're learning on our mountaintop experiences, the goal is not to come just up the mountain and to take in the view and be like, oh, that's so beautiful, and then that's enough. It's our own experience. That's not what learning process is. Learning process is now when you're up there, you need to take a good look at what you see so that you can get understanding of how when you come down that mountain, you're going to bring restoration, you're going to bring healing, you're going to bring answers, you're going to bring um, solutions to problems because you've seen them from that high place. And God will impart that to our vision. But it says that people perish for lack of vision or for lack of knowledge. So when we're choosing not to learn, we're choosing not to go up to that mountain where God wants to open our eyes to see something different, something multi-level. Um, one of his names is El Elyon, which is the high God. Um, one of his names is also high tower. He wants to take us to the high tower where the righteous run into it and they are saved, right? So there's all these aspects of God that we need on the mountain and the learning experience where he un unravels aspects of himself to us. So that we can come down that mountain and actually bring change. And the first change that happens is ourselves. And then that change that happens in ourselves multiplies into those around us because we bring change to our household. We bring change to our relationships. We bring change to how we spend our time. We bring change to how we talk. We bring change to how we think and how we process and then how we make decisions. And then how we also impart teaching to others, how we encourage others, how we speak into others. So the change starts with us, and it increases and multiplies as we're coming down and we're spreading that out to others. This is the process of a maturing individual in a discipleship model under the, the headship of Christ. So growth implies change, maturing in your conduct, and then increasing in your attentiveness, because if you're calling yourself a disciple, but you have a, a, trouble, a difficulty with keeping and maintaining your attention, that's flesh, because the Holy Spirit inside of you is attentive, and the, whole, the Spirit of truth inside of you is attentive to the truth. And it's never difficult 
for the spirit inside of us to fellowship with the truth. So we have to break that lack of focus, that flesh, and discipline it and teach it to be attentive, teach it to listen, teach it to come into the yoke of Christ. Um, And he says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light, but we still have to get into it and we have to walk with him. When we're walking with him, we're not fighting with him. So it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be light if we're fighting with him. But if we're in alignment with him, and we're walking with him, and we're listening with him, and we're following in his footsteps, it's easy, it's light, we're not getting harmed in the process because we're not fighting him in the goad. So we'll move to the next slide. Um, Coming into the letter construction, the way that this letter is built, it's built with a connection a connection point that relates to now your hands, so the letter Kof we learned last week. The letter Kof and the letter Vav make up this letter. So the number uh, that is related to Kof is 20. So Kof is the the numerical value 20. Vav is numerical value 6. And when you add them together, the numerical value is 26, which is the name of God. So this letter represents God's name. And it's also related to the letter Aleph, if you remember all the way back when we first learned the letter Aleph, we learned that Aleph is a uh, numerical value um, in its construction. It's a yod, a yod, and a vav. It's 26. So you're connecting the lamid now to the letter Aleph, and this, they share a similar picture. Lamid is about the nature of the Good Shepherd and the way that he's teaching and instructing. All it is the strength of the teaching that comes from the Father. And so it's the Father and the Son in a yoke relationship with each other in expressing different aspects of how we are being discipled. So Yeshua disciples us with the Father's instructions so that we become sons or daughters of the Father. And so the way that this letter comes together now is it's bringing a connection in working, in productivity, in producing or multiplying, increasing. So the aim is to study the scriptures, to understand them. Discipleship is represented by the letter Lamed. And then this connection, that's the Vav, that connects. It's the man who's connecting. It's connecting through his hands, through his labor, um, through his worship, um, serving. All those aspects are part of this. And it's to work to make more disciples. And so you're studying, you're being disciples to become a discipler. So the student becomes the teacher, and then the goal is to make more disciples. And it's just a multiplication process that's happening over and over and over again. So this, this letter, Lamed, with the expression of the Vav, the connecting force, and the cost, the productivity of God's hand coming together, In a discipleship model, you have the heart of the Father being expressed, and you have his name, yod heh vav It's pretty powerful. So another aspect that this unfolds is that the first letter in the Torah that ever appears in Hebrew is the letter bet, bet, in the word bereshit. That's the first uh, word in Hebrew and translates in English as in the beginning. And so the letter bet and the letter lamed come together because now the Lamed is the last letter in the Torah, in the book of Deuteronomy, the very last word in Deuteronomy, I believe it's chapter 34, is the letter Lamed in the word Israel. And so these two letters come together to form a word, which is Lev, heart. So the five books of Moses that God gives on the mountain to Moses, the instructions, the Father's instructions, are the heart of the Father imparted in an engraved stone. And it's the engravement upon the Father-Son relationship, because the word stone in Hebrew is Father and Son in one word coming together. So, Av, and then make the word Evan in Hebrew, and that's the word stone. So the father-son relationship coming together through engravement 
And so he talks about engraving his word in our heart. And this is the process of, of us becoming living stones. So this is the, these two letters coming together, the, the Lamed on the, the word Israel, and then the Bet on the word Bereshit. The word Lev tells you that from Genesis to Deuteronomy, it is the divine finger of God imparting his heart to us. That when we read the Torah, we are we can engrave those words upon our heart, and it's something supernatural that takes place. That's unusual because it's imparting the heart of God to us. Now, many people think that the Torah is just a history book; it's just telling history. But when you read it in Hebrew, study it in Hebrew, and any person can do that without knowing the Hebrew language. This is why I'm teaching you the letters is so that you can take the meanings of each letter and learn to unplug all the words. You can literally get everything free online and learn to use the tools and have access to uh, a massive amount of um, uh, the scriptures to be able to study it yourself without ever um, really learning Hebrew on a grammatical level. Um, You could just learn the letters and be able to begin to dive into this. Uh, and then the more that you get into it, most people want to learn the grammar because uh, it's very, um, it, it's, once you start to experience the impartation that happens, it's, it's not something you want to miss out on. So what I'm talking about is when you take these letters and you see this word lev, it tells a story. It's telling you about the shepherd's heart. So the, the, the rod, that letter is not just a letter that has a sound and makes a word. It's telling you something about something deeper, about what the heart is. So the heart, the lev, is about the heart is, the purpose of the heart is to become the, the, the voice of the shepherd that fills the house, because the letter bet represents the house. So it's the teaching to the son of the house, or the teaching to the um, heart that becomes a house, and it becomes a house of the scripture, or it becomes a house of the Lord, or the house of Torah, the house of God's presence, the house of God's breath, the house of God's spirit uh, in the form of his breath. All of these things can be described as the function of the heart on a spiritual level. That's how these words begin to form for us, and we'll be learning more about this as we go, because we've now covered enough letters that I can now go into this in each lesson that we do in the future, unraveling some key words so that teach you, you are taught, and I can teach you how to do this yourself whenever you're looking at a Hebrew word. But there's, there's a letter um, in this that I want you to look at on the slide. In the word bearer sheet, I've got the letter bet there in red, and the other letters are in blue. And then there's the final letter that's underlined, and it's, and it's there. It's the letter Tav again. And then the other letters in the word Israel are all blue, except for the last letter is red. So the ones that are forming the word Lev or heart are red. And the other blue letters, they're all the same letters, except for one. And that is the letter Tav. And the letter Tav is the letter, the first letter in the word Torah. So it becomes a um, solid, concrete foundation in plumb line doctrine to understand the Torah is the Father's heart and he's imparting his heart to his sons that represent Israel. Israel is the seed of the Messiah, that the Messiah is going to come out of this Israel. And it's going to be the firstborn, which is in the word Bereshit. Oh, there's there's, seven, there's a 720 words inside that word itself in Hebrew that prophesy the whole um, history of the Messiah. So all of this is contained in just a few words that I just unraveled there. There's a lot to learn. And that can be intimidating or whatever, but I'm saying all of that. It can be a little overwhelming. You might need to listen to this a couple of times. Because the point of it is, is that these words inside the Torah are not just history. They're telling you now revelations on how to live your life as a disciple. So you can go in and see in these words to find out, okay, what does it look like for me to be engrafted into Israel and produce fruit 
that is going to be ultimately um, the fruit of Israel, because we're grafted into the faith of Abraham. And the prophecy of Israel is Jacob. Jacob is named Israel. And so we're all becoming the offspring. So every single person that's grafted into this is now part of the promise made to Abraham. And now us as disciples, all of our actions are coming into this basket of fruit, so to speak, that is going to be presented at the end when we are, when we're all receiving um you know, the, the crown of life or whatever you want to call it. We're all taking part in this inheritance. And our fruit that we're producing is being gifted to God. And all of that fruit, you've got Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all of all of us are producing their fruit even still today. We're fulfilling the prophecies that God made to them. They're still being fulfilled in us. So all of the things that were promised to them what are, are written in scripture in Hebrew, you can go back and read and find out where you are in the story. And that's the goal of learning Hebrew is to find out how you are in that blueprint. Because in all of these stories that are actually history stories, there's actually blueprints that are called blueprints of the soul that help you renew your mind and you apply the stories and you apply the principles to your life and you come out. Uh, of bondage and you step into freedom. For instance, the word Egypt is restriction. So any kind of Egypt that you have in your life, you have to shed restriction and you have to go through a process of being rescued and redeemed from God, by God in order to uh, judge that, that bondage and come out into freedom and step into your promised land. So these are our, our spiritual truths um, that, you know, it's intimidating to hear, okay, we've got to learn Hebrew to do that. You don't, it's not really as intimidating as it sounds because you've already been learning. I've probably taught you 500 Hebrew words already in the, in the, it might be closer to a thousand, um, since we started. So you're actually learning a lot of Hebrew as we've been going along. And there, the Bible is only made up. If it, there's, if you knew 2000 words, you've got the whole Bible mastered in about 2000 words. So love is the Father's heart, transmitted by the Son, and it's all about learning to hear the Good Shepherd, adapting the heart of the Father, and now wherever you go, you're bringing the house of the Lord, the presence of the Lord, and you're spreading His seed and producing His harvest that He's going to come and gather. So we'll move to the next slide. Lamed in Hebrew, uh, sorry, Lamed in the grammar, is when it's prefixed, so all the letters can also be prefixed. Uh, most of them can be prefixed to words, um, and they actually are words themselves when they stand alone. So in this case, Lamed, when it stands alone, is the word two or four. When you put it into a word, like I've got there Malik, which is king, and when you have it in the saying, it's like to a king or for a king, it's Lamelik. Um, so, like, when we talk about the letter hey, would be the word the, when it's prefixed. It's the king would be Hamelik, uh, David Hamelik, or David Hamelik. Um, in this case, it's like Le Melek. It's to a king or for a king. So, Lamed, in the way that it acts as a prefix, is describing direction and the goal of an action to get to the end. Uh, so that it's completed. So that's what the shepherding process is, is the process of completion. And so we learn that as a bride, as, as you know, we're waiting for the Messiah to come, um, to, you know, return for us and take us as a bride, um, we are going through a process of completion. And we're being completed. So this is the letter Lama. That's why we need to hear the shepherd's voice, because he's going to lead us by still waters, and Psalm 23 is the process of the Torah taking root in our lives, and he is leading us to a destination, and that destination is the kingdom, the fullness of the kingdom. We'll move to the next slide. Slide number eight. So this is why we are learning. Learning in Hebrew and a Hebraic perspective is never to accumulate information and store up knowledge. The goal is always to learn um, for the purpose of 
learning, walking in perfect love. Excuse me. It's always to perfect your ability to love others, to love God, and again, to complete your journey, to finish your purpose, and to step into the fullness of your potential. Because you're not just finishing your life here in the earth, you're finishing all the lives that have gone before you and all the intercession that's gone up before you. Every seed that's ever been planted, you're a role in your generation in producing that fruit. And all of that fruit gets gathered at the end of the age. So it's about the deeds that are actually coming out of your learning process. It's who you become and how you behave and what you contribute that is now the, the, the fruit of the learning process. So Jesus says, take my yoke upon you, learn from me. I'm gentle and humble in heart. And so he'll, he'll give us rest for our souls in the process. So we'll move to the next slide. This idea of 99 versus the one, we've all heard, you know, Jesus leaves the, the, the 99 to go to the one. I'm going to explain to you what this means. The one without the Torah, the, the, the one that leaves the shepherd's fold is the one. The 99 are those who studied and have learned, and they've listened to the voice of the shepherd. They're staying in the boundaries. So when a shepherd would teach the sheep, he teaches them through clicking sounds, through, through certain noises, through certain gestures, and through certain motions, using his staff or whatever instrument he's using when he's teaching the sheep. As he's doing that process, he's teaching them how to stay within boundaries. Whether there's a fence there or not a fence there, the sheep have to know the boundaries. And they stay close to the shepherd's voice where they can hear the shepherd's voice. That's the place of safety. Now, if they're not listening to the shepherd's voice, they wander out of the zone of safety where they can be devoured by uh, animals, wild animals, so to speak. And so the, the process of learning the shepherd's voice is that when you're in the shepherd's field, when you're in the boundaries of the shepherd's field, if you move into new territory, he has to reteach you the boundaries of the field because you're now in a new zone. So when we get upgraded spiritually, when we mature, we have to also keep coming back and learning to hear the shepherd's voice. Because if we think that the last season is going to work, it's not going to work because the boundaries have changed. We've upgraded. The boundaries have been extended. Um, the, 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 the field has been extended. It's a bigger zone now because we've been promoted to a bigger field. Um, he's trusting us with greater responsibilities. When that happens, we have to come back and learn the shepherd's voice again. So we have to keep learning what he speaks. And even though we think we already know, we have to keep coming back again and learning it again. Um, and he might teach it a little bit differently and give us a deeper level or deeper revelation of himself that he has to build upon. So he can't just unveil it all to us at once. He can't handle it. He has to do it in stages. So this is why you have to keep coming back. And you can't assume that you know or assume that you've heard that before. Or even assume what you think he's saying because he might speak the same way, but, but the information might be uh, deeper that you have to go deeper to get the treasure out of it. So this is the one and the 99. The 99 are those who've learned the shepherd's voice, and they go through the seasons of relearning and relearning and relearning, and they stay in the boundaries of the shepherd. The one is the one who just doesn't get it, who just doesn't submit, that doesn't want to listen, that wants to wander, that that explores beyond the safety perimeters, that thinks that, you know, they're just because they wander a little bit over here, they're still okay because they're on that fine line, um, but they can get snatched. And so he goes after the one who's not learning, the one who's rejecting or refusing to be discipled. And he disciplines, and he teaches and instructs and he takes them aside and he has to um, do this outside of this, the shepherd's field because the one that doesn't have the Torah, the one who's not learning can contaminate the, the whole flock 
by teaching a different sound and leading them all astray. Because if the sheep that's now wandering away hasn't learned the new boundaries, that sheep can teach all of the others to walk a, uh, walk the wrong direction and be away from the shepherd's voice because the sheep hasn't learned. And that's the, that's the one. He goes after the one to teach them the instruction so that they're not going to deceive the rest of the flock when they come back. Um, and so there's a whole process that's involved in that the scriptures talk about. He even says in John chapter 10 that the hired shepherd won't make the effort to teach the one sheep that's wandering. Because, and they won't go after the one sheep that's wandering because it's not worth it to them because they're hired to do a job. And so they're not caring about the soul, the end result. They'll just let that one wander, and if they end up getting eaten by wolves, um, so be it, because, you know, they turn their head and let it happen, because their duty is to look after the 99 who are paying attention. And it's reflecting on the hardness of heart in a leader who's now neglected the compassion role, the benevolent role of a shepherd in in having that constant... Um, eye out on the one who needs a little extra, little extra care, a little extra patience, a little extra kindness, a little extra time being discipled because there's something they're not getting. And sometimes rebellion isn't always just utter rebellion. Sometimes it's unbelief. Sometimes they need evidence. They need proof. They need substance to grab a hold of. And they need time to come into that. And so Jesus knows that. And this is the, what the parable of, this, of that is all about in Luke 10, or in John chapter 10. So that's the one in the 99. He runs after the one because the other side of the coin is, is that with that sheep doesn't learn the instruction, they're the wolf in sheep's clothing potentially that's going to cause them all to get devoured because he's leading them all astray. Um, so that's the idea. So let's move on to the next slide. This is Psalm 23. We can come back to this at the end, but I just want to show you that this is actually the process of the Torah taking root in your life. When the Father's instructions become a part of your soul, David says that the Torah moved into his heart and took over his life. It became his breath. Um, And so uh, in this Psalm, he's talking about, you know, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He's using certain verbs here, like he leads, he makes me lie down, he restores, he guides. And then it talks about the experiential aspect of the journey. He's leading the paths of righteousness, the green pastures, the places I'm not going to want, the valley of the shadow of death, and um, the comfort that's experiencing, the discipline, the staff, the rod, the presence of the enemy being there, that he's now going to sit at the table. He's going to eat in the presence of his enemy because it says in the scriptures to feed your enemy water and bread, which is representative of Torah, that you can sit at the table and fellowship with your enemy when you're giving them the Torah because now they're not your enemy. They become your friend. And so he's you anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. I dwell in the house of Adonai forever. So this is the process of it taking root in your life. That's what Psalm 23 is about. Move on to the next slide. The tallest order. So we've talked about the letter being the tallest letter. Um, It's the tallest order of our heart. That's what it represents is our heart string. Is that our number one call, the ultimate call of our lives, our highest aim to reach for is discipleship, is to be discipled by Jesus. And Jesus, his name, Yeshua, means salvation. And so salvation is the mountain we're climbing. We're going to work out our salvation with fear and trembling every day. And so the question is, for everyone, all the time, every day, is he worth the journey? Is salvation worth the journey? We've got to complete that race. And so is the journey about the view, which we talked about earlier, from the mountaintop, or is it about returning to the valley to give out to others what he's given to you? Is the ledge for you to rest, or is it the place where you see how others are functioning and that you can come down now and meet their needs, and now you're going to impart 
uh, that need and meet that need uh, that they have. So you're not going to give your revelation. You're giving them the revelation of Yeshua. You're giving them his revelation. You're just receiving to give. That's your role. He's imparting, he's filling you up to overflow so that you are now overflowing, giving away. And it's not our revelation. This has nothing to do with you and me. We're getting his revelation of himself, of his father, of his father's heart, imparting it into ourselves. And then we're giving that revelation away to make more sons and daughters for the spirit of adoption to cry out, Abba, Father. And and then that whole process is happening. This is to be the core of our spiritual life. This is our actual destiny, spiritual destiny. We get assignments that are the physical assignments, but this is our spiritual destiny. This is tied to our worship, which is our reasonable service, putting ourselves on the altar of sacrifice, making sure we are presenting ourselves to learn what is the perfect, acceptable, uh, and good will of God. That's what Paul talks about. So we're coming in with this intention, the desires to know the giver of the Torah better so that we can now bring the answers and solutions that are in it to others. So you got to know it. You can't just know the history of it. you got to know what substance is actually in there. And this is something we've severely neglected in the evangelical aspect of Christianity because we focus so much on, on revival and and hype, and a lot of those things, and, and you know, there's places and times and seasons for different things that we, we go after, but ultimately, the one thing that we're to impart that is ever, that's never changing is, is the instruction of the Lord, and most of what's lacking today is the truth and understanding what is the Bible actually saying, and what does this mean to me? And so people are just not reading it because they don't know how to interpret it and they don't know how to read it. They don't know how to read themselves into the story. And so now it's just inspirational messages and fluffed up stuff, but it's not producing freedom. The truth produces freedom. And that's what Jesus came to give us is freedom. He is the living Torah and his living Torah resurrects. And we want resurrection life coming out of our mouth when we speak his word. So the Torah itself is the reward. That's the reward for our soul, is to learn the Torah. And to learn the Torah now, that's our reward for this life. So we'll move to the next slide. The goal of learning, this is uh, 1 Timothy 1, verses 5. This is the verse. It says, now the goal of this command is love from a pure heart and a clear conscience and a genuine faith. The context of this verse, when you read it in verse 4, is God's training is in faithfulness. He's training us in faithfulness. That's the foundation of this verse. And so what does it look like to reach this goal? That's what this verse is going to get to. So I broke down these words a little bit. The word for goal here in the sentence is telos, or I think, I, I don't know how to pronounce Greek. I don't know Greek very well, but telos or telos is where we get the word telescope from in English. It's like a pirate telescope unfolds in, in layers. So you got to pull the whole thing apart in order for it to reach its full capacity. When it's short, it can go a certain distance, but when it's long, it can achieve a greater distance. So you pull it out in order to get the full capacity. That's what this word means. And it's a command, which relates to like, like just like in, in, in Hebrew, it's a general giving an instruction to his, his, Soldiers with their feet on the ground, the commander in chief, and it says his preferred will that comes through your ears of faith. Now it's the inner man. That's what this word is telling you. That the inner man inside of you, like hearing the sound of the voice, is like a radio frequency, and responding to the message. Um, that's the word command. It's coming from interior outward, so that you're now being pulled in a certain direction for a specific outcome, and. The goal is love. Agape there is the word benevolence, actually. And it relates to goodwill, uh, compassion, empathy, being available uh, in your emotional condition, being emotionally available to people, and kindness. And then the word pure is, you know, having a pure heart relates to your decisions, your processes, your thoughts, your character, being pure. 
clearer uh, conscience is like it, the word good that now it's, it's, it's the aspect that your this word clear means like what originates from God is now being joined to your conscience. And your conscience is the self-judging innate discernment. This is your self-awareness on a morality level joined to a divine, clear um, message from God that you're hearing in your inner man. It's coming together. It's called consciousness. And as a result, you're able to walk something out. You have a consciousness of something. And then faith comes to be, this is the word trust. Uh, it's the same word, pistis, as in Hebrew is amuna, amuna, and genuine, sincere. And this means being trustworthy without hypocrisy being present. There's no hypocrisy. You are as sincere as sincere can be. This is what this verse is telling us. It's telling us that the goal The message that's being transmitted is that we would love, that we would be benevolent, kind, show compassion, be emotionally available to people from the place of a pure heart, surrendered our decisions, our processes, our thoughts, our character, our evaluations of people would come from a pure heart, and we would have a clear conscience in how we're dealing with people, being without hypocrisy, being completely self-aware. And our morality and our self-awareness working together in a very amazing self-judging innate discernment, which means that we're, we're dealing with ourselves before we're ever looking at somebody else. And then our faith and our trust come together to create a consciousness that allows us to be effective and to reach the full capacity of effectiveness. That's what this verse is telling us. So that's the goal of instruction. That's the purpose of why we learn is for that outcome to happen. Love, a pure heart, a clear conscience, and a genuine faith. No hypocrisy. We'll move to the next slide. Um, He continues on about those who've missed the mark, meaning that they're not... Uh, they're not learning the Torah. They're not. They're not taking in the instructions because that's what it means. The Torah, Yura, the shooting of the arrow, the shooting of the arrow, and the arrow misses the mark. It's chata, which means sin. And so now the result is tuning into fruitless. The, the go into evil speech because now they're not speaking the truth. Their, their mouth isn't joined to truth. Their mouth isn't joined to the spirit of truth because they're going into vain imaginations discussing about the word without getting understanding. This happens a lot. And then you're now, when that happens, you turn what is called the evil eye on people and you start looking at all their sins. And so it's like, we know that the Torah is good if one uses it legitimately, knowing that the Torah is not given for a sadi, which means a righteous one, but the lawless, the rebellious, the ungodly, the sinful, the unholy, the worldly, and so on. Uh, List all these different sins. Um, things that relate to opposing sound teaching, when we've been entrusted with this good news message, it's our job to make sure this happens in a sound way, that we're faithful with this process. And he says at the end here, Paul says at the end here, Messiah, that this is um, the saying that's deserving and complete acceptance is Messiah Yeshua came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am foremost. Okay, many people read this verse, thinking that it's talking about the world, and it is talking about the world, but it's talking about the world in believers, in us, our world inside of us that needs to submit to Torah. Torah wasn't given to people in the nations. You were not given the Torah unless you were in covenant with God. You could not, actually, Jesus made it very, very clear that the truth was not in a person if they're not in covenant. And so they don't have the capacity to receive the Torah, and you should never, ever expect someone to ever uh, to, to be able to have the capacity to receive the Torah unless the Spirit of God inside of them comes alive and snatches and grabs hold of the Torah, which means that there's a seed of righteousness inside of them that's grabbing hold. So the Torah is written to the sinner in us so that we become righteous, that we become a sadiq. And Sadiq, and when we get to the letter Sade, is uh, one of my favorite letters. Um, it's describing the posture of a righteous person as an intercessor. And the intercession itself is bridging the gap, especially inside yourself, between the truth and the lie, between unrighteousness and righteousness. And you're filling it with yourself. 
and you're putting it upon yourself to become righteous. That's intercession. That's how you bring righteousness into the earth. That's how you fill the gap. You become the one who actually lays down your life to become it. And you become righteous. So this verse is saying that the, the Torah is good. It's When it's used legitimately, it's telling you your sin so that you become righteous. It's not condemning you because there's no condemnation for those who are in Messiah. This is telling you the sin and the lawlessness and rebelliousness and the unholiness and the worldliness inside of you that needs to be worked out and come into the sound teaching, the truth of the Torah, so that as a result, something happens. And we'll go into what happens in the next slide. Slide number 14. What does the goal look like? Paul goes on to say, I thank Messiah Yeshua, our Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, appointing me to service. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent man, yet I was shown mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed with the faith and the love that are in Messiah Yeshua. So now he's now addressing the verse that was before about the goal of faith and love and all that. Trustworthy is the saying and deserving of complete acceptance. Messiah Yeshua came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am foremost the sinner, the chief of sinners. Yet for this reason, that reason, this reason alone, I was shown mercy so that in me as foremost, Messiah Yeshua might demonstrate his complete patience as an example for those about to put their trust in him for eternal life. What he's saying here is that. Our process with God is supposed to be so so transparent and visible, our maturing process, to those who are what we would call sinners. Uh, they would see our whole process to prove that the gospel is powerful to bring redemption, to bring freedom, to take the soul out of exile and to cause us to walk in that perfect peace. And the, this whole patient process that God does in us, taking us from our immaturity to our place of becoming a mature, chlios type son, that's like the Greek word for a, a full stature of maturity in a, in a son, and that's now happening. So now the people who are about to put their trust in eternal life, they actually have the evidence that they've just seen that process worked out in you. That's your testimony. So we're not to forget where we come from and who we were before Jesus came. And we, when we're walking out our process, we remember every single day that God is patient and long-suffering, and that he is the one working the process out in us. He promised to carry out the, pro the, the whole process in us. He is going to carry it to completion. That's the promise. It's in Philippians. And so we want to give him honor, glory, admiration, and, and all of those things forever and forever because our lives are bearing witness to the fact that this gospel works. Being a disciple works. Being matured season to season, brick upon brick, layer upon layer, precept upon precept, a little here, a little there. All of this process is happening and he is so very patient with us. And that this is the reason we're shown mercy. He calls us out. He gives us an assignment where we go from being this level of sin into now stepping into becoming one who disciples others. It's an amazing process. It's very, very beautiful. We want to honor the process that God's working out in people and working out in ourselves and learn to do each step at a time, see from this higher perspective that I was talking about, and understand where we're all at in our journey, so we're encouraging and building each other up in love and walking this process out, while also learning the discipline, correcting the things in our lives that need to be corrected, understanding that the process of that correction is resulting in somebody taking hope that is now going to be able to put their trust in eternity as a result of watching that process be walked out. They can sense the spirit because it awakens eternity in the heart of man. So this is the goal. This is achieving a goal, what it looks like. Remember where you come from. So we'll move to the next slide. 
that's what we're talking about, that the Torah, I mentioned this already, that the Torah is about you. The Torah is written to you. It's your covenant document to tell you how to live your life, not to look at somebody else's life. This is your marriage contract. You're not, you're not looking at somebody else's marriage contract to figure out how to run your marriage. You're looking at your marriage contract to figure out how to run your household. You're not watching how other people are running their household, sitting there telling them how to run their household. That's obnoxious. You're telling yourself, disciplining yourself, and, and restoring yourself through the, the Word of God so that your household is restored, so that peace comes to you, peace comes to your mind. And as a result, you might be given the place that the Lord will allow you to speak into somebody else's life because they, they can see the fruit and they see it being worked out in you. So this is what Paul's trying to get across, that you have the Torah inside you. The living Torah is living inside of you. It's written and given to instruct the sinner in you to crucify your flesh. You who are in covenant with God, it's your flesh that you need to call into obedience. And that's the disciplining process. You are teaching your flesh to listen to the shepherd of your soul. You're teaching that. You're teaching your soul this. With the help of the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, the spirit of holiness, and then living Torah himself, who is, who is now... The more that you do this is being strengthened inside of you because he's living inside of you. He's, um, the scripture where it says that um, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This is the idea. Dead people don't sin. So if you have died to yourself, you're not sinning. But if you are sinning, then you need the Torah to crucify your flesh. That's what the Torah is for. The Torah is not a set of rules and regulations and do this and do that and you have to do it this way and you have to do it that way and some kind of this, this that's not what it is it's it's putting your soul on the altar the way that they put an animal on the altar and crucifying your flesh and when that happens you are able to hear the shepherd speaking more clearly the more you sacrifice your flesh the more the shepherd's voice becomes clear because you're clearing the environment around your soul, around the ears upon your soul. Your spirit is getting clearer vision, is getting clearer uh, hearing, is, is your heart, the spirit of your heart, the spirit of your mind. It's all getting clean and being washed. And so you're teaching your flesh to listen to the shepherd of your soul. This is what being a disciple is about. And you're putting the death to the sinner that's inside of you and making alive, quickening the righteousness, the law of righteousness, the spirit of righteousness inside of you that is the living Torah inside of you engraved in your being to help you walk out righteousness, holiness, truth, faithfulness, discipline, trust. You know, we're talking about the fruit of the spirit and all these things. Who is the living Torah? That's salvation. Yeshua means salvation. So the living Torah engraved in your being is your salvation, and salvation is a person living inside of you, and that person is working out your salvation. When you die to your flesh, you're not listening to your flesh anymore. You're listening to the shepherd instruct you, and now Yeshua gets to speak. Yeshua gets to do. Yeshua gets to create. Yeshua gets to instruct, and now as a result, you're able to hear everything that he's saying, do what he's saying, and the result is that your soul, your mind, your body becomes a vessel of honor. You become the living scroll. Your life becomes the word to somebody else that when they're watching you, they can read you, and when they're reading you, they're reading the Torah. The Torah is coming alive for them, and they can trust in the Torah, because they're seeing it without hypocrisy. This is what is the goal of discipleship. So when you're walking out the Spirit, that word Israel is a very interesting word, because it starts with the letter Yod, which represents the Spirit. It ends with the letter Lamed, which represents discipleship. It's telling you the process of sonship is coming into the Spirit, the Spirit of truth, Spirit of holiness, 
And you're going to go through the fire, that's the sheen, and then you're going to come into a place of prayer, which is the resh. Then you're coming into this yoke relationship where you're walking with the Father and Son. And then you step into the shepherd's voice now leading and guiding you in everything. And this is a path. So you walk the path of sonship. That's what those letters, these letters are telling you in the word Israel. There's more ways you can break this down, but that's one way you could do it. So where's the verse that tells us this? John 16, it says, I still have much more to tell you. This is Jesus talking, but you cannot handle it right now. But when the spirit of truth comes, he's going to guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own, doesn't speak on his own. Whatever he hears, he will tell you, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me because he will take from from what is mine, this is Jesus speaking, and declare it to you. Everything that the Father has is mine. And for this reason, I said the Ruach will take from what is mine and declare it to you. And he's talking about the scriptures. He's talking about the word. He's the manifestation of the scriptures. The Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth is going to take from the manifestation and is going to speak it to you to manifest it in you. And you're going to walk out the life of Christ. You're going to walk in his steps and you're going to be the witness to the life of Christ. This is the gospel being worked out in us. Salvation. And the spirit walks out the Torah as the spirit of Torah, which is truth. And so it's, we're talking about the same thing. The spirit of truth and the Torah is the spirit of Torah. And so that's when you get into that phrase, the, the letter of the law versus the spirit of the law is the spirit of truth is walking out the spirit of the law. But we're not talking about law anymore. The law is, is, is now under the, the flesh is, is, is being crucified. Now what we're talking about is the resurrection life that's coming out. And that's the goal of why we take in the instruction. We're going to walk it out in the spirit. So we'll go to the next slide, slide number 17. When you make this journey, which is the, the, from the, the Yod to the Lamed, in this word, Israel, you're taking the steps toward prosperity. I'm going to show you something cool. Happiness, contentment, creativity, direction, all of this is part of this word. You get further, you can also get further away from idolatry and spiritual immorality the more that you walk this out, and the result is blessing. It's prosperity. Prosperity being not money, but the wealth is actually the Torah itself. The Torah is considered to be the most valuable treasure you could ever receive um, because it's also your salvation. The Torah is part of your salvation. So the letters in between the Yod and the Lamed I have many words there on the slide that are all spelled with those letters. And it's Asher, to go straight, to be blessed, to be happy, to be guided. Asher, blessedness, happiness, and the phrase literally, be happy. Osher is happiness. Asher, which is the actual name of one of the tribes, um, the tribe of Asher, which is the happy one. And they were the creativity people. And they did, like, the landscaping. They were culinary arts. That was Asher's tribe. They were talented people. Um, and then there's Ashura, which is very interesting because when you put the hay on it and you make this word feminine, um, it turns into idolatry um, it's because this word becomes a goddess. And so you can pursue the wrong happiness, the wrong spirituality, the wrong instruction, the wrong Torah. Um, you, it means that you're not listening to the Torah of the Father. You're not listening to the shepherd's voice. You're listening to the wrong breath, which is the wrong spirit. And that, that breath is coming into you artificially now, connecting you to artificial life support, not the true life. And you can build a false foundation and be completely convinced this is real. And yet you don't live in Israel, which is the word is real. Uh, you're living in a false reality. And that's Asherah. This is the goddess, one of the goddesses mentioned in the Old Testament. Um, and that's a, an idol. It's, it's, it relates to, like, a lot of things that you wouldn't want in your life. So the word tells us that the substance of sonship comes through this word. The process of prosperity and being blessed comes as a result of us walking that journey. 
And we see all those things that we want to see. We want to see ourselves experience the prosperity of God where our steps, our goings, our, our comings and our goings are covered. So if you add your own revelation, because you're not listening and you're not being taught and you're not being discipled by the Lord, you can end up on the path of falsehood and create a whole counterfeit life for yourself, thinking that you're in covenant when you're not. And you're creating a whole false reality. And this is something that we'll learn about called Shekhar. And that requi- it's a life that requires you to lie to yourself, tell yourself lies, to build an image of yourself for yourself. So that you are seen and heard and received. So you belong. And it could be a completely different uh, covenant that you're joining yourself to in the process because you're getting an artificial breath supply. And you don't even necessarily know that it's happening. And this is what it means to go astray. To um, leave the path of truth and go into wandering into falsehood. Path of falsehood. So we'll move to the next slide. This is how also another aspect of looking at this word Israel. Um, it starts with the smallest letter that ends with, you know, the practicing of the commandments, the practicing. And we're talking about commandments. We're talking about instructions being like practical things like, you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Don't do to others what you don't want done to you. Don't covet after your neighbor's stuff. Don't steal what they have. Um, don't gossip and slander your neighbor, things like that. These are, these are called commandments. Those are instructions. And so when you neglect them, what you are neglecting is love. When you fail at the instructions of the Lord, that's what sin is, you're failing at love. You're just failing at love. And so you just repent and you learn again. You try again to walk in love. And so that's why you sit in repentance, and then you return back to the instruction to love. That's what this all is about. So in Matthew, we have that interesting verse where it says, Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever keeps and teaches them, this one shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. We talked about this verse last week. Um, But I want you to understand this word break is not uh, someone, uh, like sometimes we'll think of it as like, um, just like, and uh, just not doing it. Someone who's not doing the commandment. It's actually worse than that. It's that you're actually trampling them underfoot intentionally. Um, and to keep them means that you actually stand as a watchman or as a gatekeeper over the Word of God to protect and to preserve it, to make sure it doesn't get broken, to get trampled underfoot. So that's what this is. So the word Israel is even telling us, don't be one who neglects it. Come to the full stature, the letter that's the tallest letter. Go from the place of humility into the full stature, the full maturity of the headship of Christ. And as a result, you become great in the kingdom of God. And it's not about being great as in greatness. It's about understanding what God calls great, what God God calls great is his, he is all about his instructions, keeping his instructions. That's his entire focus uh, in our spiritual life is us keeping those instructions. And that was what Jesus did. And that's what he focused on. So into the next slide. We come to the whole don't add or take away, which is scary stuff. Deuteronomy 4 verses 1 to 2 says, Now Israel, listen to the statutes and ordinances that I'm teaching you to do. Let's look at it into the Lamed concept. So that you may live and go in and possess the land that Adonai, the God of your fathers, is giving you. So it's about your success. You must not add to the word that I'm commanding you or take away from it in order to keep the mitzvot. Uh, those are the instructions of Adonai, your God, that I'm commanding you. Don't add or take away from them. And then he says in Deuteronomy 5.1, Moses called out to all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and the ordinances that I'm speaking in your hearing today. Learn them and make sure to do them. And then there's some references there. Now, we're not to add or take away to the scriptures because there's consequences that come with that. And there's some curses that actually relate to that. And we'll, we'll look at this a little bit. What is, what is this verse talking about? To add 
is to conceive again, to create a whole new, a whole new teaching, to come up with something completely uh, on your own, your own understanding that's not attached to the Father at all. You're making up your own instruction. Um, this is, you know, the idea of rebellion. And the word that's here is to add is to say, literally, you're going to conceive again. And where two means that you're now doing this in all directions, upon, above, over. You're surrounding yourself with uh, understanding that you've reconceived. You've, you're, re- you're now um, potentially changing and altering how you ascend that mountain. And so you're turning that mountain now, that's the mountain of God, into a mountain, a shrine of idolatry. And you're climbing up the wrong mountain to get the wrong perspective, and now you're going to end up seeing the wrong thing, coming down with the wrong goals, coming down with the wrong plans, and you're going to execute unrighteousness, is what this is talking about. So the word uh, for word there can be used two ways. It's spelled um, with three letters, and that is the letter Dalit, the letter Bet, and the letter Raish. I'm sorry, I don't have that there. Um, it's either Debar or Debar. The B's and the V's are the same, same letter. Um, or Dever, or, which is the word being to speak, or Dever, which is pestilent. Same word spelled the same way, slightly different in the pronunciation. One means to speak, to create it in, in how you speak, thoughts, putting sentences together. And the other word means literally pestilence, plague, disease. So depending upon how you are adding to the scriptures, you potentially are creating disease, pestilence, and releasing that uh, from your mouth and from your actions. And it says you. This word you has a, has the direct object to it. So it's got the olive top attached to it. It's a very important word. It's telling, it's like, this is about you and you and no one else. You're not looking at your neighbor. You're not looking at somebody else. This is about you, between you and the Lord, and it's a covenant issue. God takes up covenant issue with this specific um, action of adding to his word, which is in that, when when you see that word can become visible, that seal. Um, it's never translated in English, but it's very, very important. Uh, to take away is to diminish. To make it less. It's not as important. Uh, so that one, that, following that instruction is not as important as following this instruction. But um, you're never to actually break an instruction in order to follow an instruction. That would be walking in deception. God's never going to tell you to break one of his instructions in order to complete one of his instructions. And so it's, that's, what, that's what happens when we're taking away from things. We're making something, it's not as important, so it's okay if I do it this time. Um, and we tell little white lies, all those kinds of things. And it, it all gets um, caught up to us, which is what that word Dever is saying, is disease and decay. And death happens to our lives on some form or another. There's some kind of separation that will happen as a result of us adding or taking away to Scripture. And so the goal here is, is to keep it. And the word keep means to watch over, to preserve. You become a watchman, a guard over the scriptures. That's what he's asking us to do when we're discipling nations, is to watch over the word so he can perform it. And we want to make sure that we're keeping the word sound so that he can accomplish the word that he wrote and not end up having to release the curses and the pestilence because we've rejected that word or we've cast it down or crushed it under our feet. So that's the seriousness of keeping. So we'll move to the next slide. Revelation tells the same story. Um, don't add or take away. He says, I'll add to them the plagues that are written in this book. So it matches that word in the Old Testament as dever that I was talking about is pestilence and plague. And so you're taking away um, when you do this. God can take away from your share in the tree of life and the holy city and uh, those things that are written in this book. So it's pretty severe stuff. And it relates to idolatry because it says in Deuteronomy 32, be careful not to get trapped into imitating um, the nations that they're now uh, setting up because this is now them about to go into the promised land and take it over and establish the constitution of God in these places. Canaan was now going to become Israel. So this is what this verse is talking about. 
that now when you're going in and you're conquering these nations, that you're not going to go in and imitate their God, take on their lifestyle, take on their belief system that God himself has destroyed. And this says, do not inquire about their God, saying, how did these nations serve their gods? I will do the same. Don't worship God the same way somebody else is worshiping. And adjust it a little bit to your liking and say, okay, well, you know, it's not breaking scripture because, you know, it's a little bit different. This is what he's talking. He's saying that actually is adding and taking away from his scripture to do that. It's in your actions. So that comes into the law uh, that relates to the spirit of the law of something. So he says, you're not to act this way towards Adonai, your God, for every abomination, that, that's a word that relates to idolatry, you become an idol yourself before God. And uh, what you want becomes an idol before God. And so it's, it's an abomination of Adonai, which he hates. They have done to their gods, the things that they've done to their gods. They've even burnt their children, their sons and daughters, throwing their, their kids into the fire of the gods, and so on, so forth. So he's saying, don't worship me the same way the nations worship. I want you to have a set-apart worship. I want you to be uh, holy, and I, I'm setting you up to now follow my instructions. I'm telling you what I call worship, and that's what the whole uh, Exodus and Deuteronomy and Leviticus, all of that is saying that this is what my worship is. I don't want to be worshipped like the gods of another nation. They required animal sacrifices, uh, but the sacrifices that they required were human sacrifices, whereas God took the, the animal sacrifice because the animal represented the animal in us, the, the defiled nature in us, so that we would now put our blood on the altar and have it cleansed and come out as a human. So he reversed, actually, the worship that was happening in the nation. So move to the next slide. So the whole idea is that if it doesn't, if something that you are abiding by doesn't agree with God's word, then you need to reexamine it. You need to always make sure that how you are living, making decisions, processing God's word, processing your revelation from God, that it's always in agreement with himself. He's always in agreement with himself. He's never learning something new about himself. So he's going to transmit something to you that he already knows about himself. It's not going to be a surprise to him, so he's already written about it. So you need to go to the Word and be diligent to find what he's speaking to you in the Word and get the revelation that he wants you to have about himself. Move to the next slide, slide number 23. I have come to this point where I realize how much um, there's, there's a lot of talk in the, in the church about removing the Old Testament. There are churches, um, many of them, that are removing the Old Testament from the Christian paradigm, who teach that Jesus created a new religion, that Jesus, when he came, created Christianity, that his goal was to start Christianity, that that was the whole point, um, that he rejected Israel, uh, something called replacement theology. Um, but when you actually go to Acts 11 and you look at the word Christian when it's used for the first time, in Greek, it's the word Christian. In Hebrew, the same word would be Messianic. Um, Christos is where you get the word Christ. And in Hebrew, that's equivalent to Mashiach, which is Messiah. So Christos is Mashiach. Is Messiah, so Christ and Messiah, same word. Christian and Messianic, same word. Jesus didn't start a new religion. He didn't create a new Bible. He didn't, he didn't do anything new. He built on the same foundation. And how we don't really talk about is the fact that Jesus never wrote a single scripture. He didn't change. He was the Messiah. He was the king, potentially, to, 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 to set up his throne in Israel. Um, which is, you know, he, he didn't at that time. He's going to be doing that in the future. So he never wrote a single scripture, which is very interesting because all of the other religions, all their gurus, all of their, they write scripture. That's, that's the thing that they do. Jesus never wrote a single word of scripture. He never changed any of the scriptures. He didn't, he didn't alter the scrolls so that they would read differently so you have a better understanding of him. Uh, so that some things would make sense to the Gentile audience. Every single thing that's written in Scripture, that's considered Scripture, is all written by a Jewish audience, uh, or all written by Jewish writers, sorry. Um, and it's to, it was 
it was directed um, in language to a Jewish culture and at a time where people were being grafted into uh, a faith that was based off of a Jewish root. So the whole paradigm is understanding Jesus as a Jew and understanding what it looks like being grafted into this faith um, as a Gentile coming into the mindset of Jesus, not coming into his ethnicity. Our ethnicity doesn't change when we get saved. Our culture of our mind changes. And it's the difference between a Gentile, Gentile is like Western culture. Um, Hellenism is what Western thinking is. Um, and uh, Hebraic thinking, which is the faith of Abraham. We were told to renew our mind. That's Roman, um, is to renew our mind, to, to come into the mindset of Christ, to put on the mind of the Mashiach, the Messiah. So when we actually study scripture and understand the storyline, he's not creating anything. He's not adding to scriptures. He's not establishing a new doctrine. He's not, he's, he's never altered a single letter in his father's scrolls. He did not add or take away. So when those scriptures talk about don't add or take away, and when Jesus himself is saying in Revelation, don't add or take away, he himself as the Messiah who was the Word in flesh did not alter a single element of his father's instructions. He taught them, stayed true to them, and even raised them higher. So that's something very, very important to consider in the debates that are going on today about divorcing the Old Testament and separating ourselves and saying that it's irrelevant, it doesn't have anything to do with Christianity. But the fact of the matter is, is that Christianity doesn't actually really exist in the Bible. There's just the messianic thinking. Um, Christianity is something that was created by man. It's a systematic uh, thing. And we're all, I'm a Christian, so I'm not saying that don't be a Christian. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm talking about, though, understanding the conversation of the Bible from the lens of not separating from understanding the history is Jewish. The language is Jewish. The Hebraisms, the idioms, the grammar, the stories, the parables, the agriculture, all of it is based off of a Jewish mindset. And so we have to learn and understand those aspects of Jesus, because Jesus is returning as a king, as a Jewish king ruling from Israel. So he's going to be talking the same way he's going to be speaking Hebrew. Um, we don't understand to the degree of what this looks like on a spiritual level and on a practical level. But the fact of the matter is that this is what's going to happen. Um, and so we want to always be in the place where we're ready and waiting for his return, that we're in alignment. He's not just coming here to take us to sweep us away and take us to heaven. He's going to come and return and establish a kingdom for a thousand years. That's our inheritance. That's what we're receiving as an inheritance is being with him for those 1,000 years. So we want to make sure that we are working towards the mindset, that our lives, everything that we're doing, the fruit that we're producing is of the mindset of Christ, that we're learning how he thinks. We're learning how he does. We learn how he processes. He never changed his father's words. He did not consider himself equal, to be equal with God. He thought that was robbery. He didn't steal his father's reputation and put it upon himself and alter his father's word, he kept everything the same and then says that this is going to be the way it is until the new Jerusalem. So we want to understand when Jesus says that true love as a disciple is keeping his instructions. And we want to pay attention to that because Jesus himself didn't add or take away. He kept it all sound. He guarded and protected his father's words with his life and gave his life so that we have the father's words so that we have them to live out because we have his example having lived it out. Now the living Torah, the one who established righteousness by living the Torah, he moves in and dwells inside of us. He's actually living inside of us. So he's the one obeying the scriptures. 
inside of you and me. This is what trust means. This is what faith means. To put our trust in the Messiah means that we're putting our trust in his ability to live out his own instructions through us and abide according to his father's instructions because he already proved he could do it in the earth as a man that now he's going to bring us into the alignment to do it as well so that we reach the fullness of our maturity in Christ and we complete the salvation process. That's what we're being told here in the scriptures. We want to be able to understand it, walk it out, and this is the good news that we're telling people. We're not bringing them into a new religion and having people convert. You, you, when you're talking to a Jewish person, you're not asking them to convert to Christianity. Um, they're just becoming messianic, um, which is what was always in existence. It's just, there's just messianic. And we could give it all the titles, we can have all the denominations, we can have all the names that we want. At the end of the day, what God's looking for is that our truth is one truth with each other. And that is the Messiah, the kingdom of God, the resurrection of the righteous, and the paradigm that we have about what it is to step into the fullness, the full revelation of the one thousand those near reign, and then come into the new time of the new Jerusalem. Just what his word says. We want to walk out the fullness of our salvation uh, until we come into that place of our glorified body and then our eternal state in the new Jerusalem. So this is what we want to understand. Jesus did not add or change or, or create his own scriptures. He only chose 12 to now set the paradigm for what he wanted taught about himself um, that related to the Torah. So we'll move to the next slide. Most Christians don't know about this verse, where this is a prophecy um, that relates to the Messiah. Um, he did not accomplish this uh, in his first coming, because he's going to accomplish it in the second coming. And this is called the King of Torah. Deuteronomy 17, 18, to 19 says, Now when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he is to write for himself a copy of this Torah on a scroll from that which is before the Levitical Holy is talking about the Holy Holy it will remain with him, and he will read it in all the days of his life in order to learn to fear Adonai his God and keep all the words of this Torah and these statutes. This is a Messianic prophecy about when Jesus comes as King David, sitting on the throne, he will write for himself a Torah. He didn't do it the first time. He will be doing it the second time. But he's not writing a new Torah. He's writing the same Torah. And he says in John five nineteen. Therefore Yeshua answered them, Amen, Amen, I tell you. The son cannot do anything by himself. He can do only what he sees the father doing. Whatever the father does, the son does likewise. This is what Yeshua is discipling us in. He's teaching us how to walk with the father, to fulfill the father's instructions, producing the fruit that glorifies the father. But we're doing it as the disciples of Yeshua. We are his students of his righteousness. We're observing his righteousness. And how he faithfully lived out his father's instructions. He stayed joined to his father at all times. He did not add or take away. He didn't create his own doctrine. He didn't create his own theology. He didn't have his own preferences. He didn't have his own interpretations. He only went by exactly what the father's words said, the father's definitions of those words. And this is why we're learning Hebrew, so that we can stay true to what Yeshua did and what he accomplished in his life and then pass to us to do the same. So in order to become true disciples, we have to learn to become less, to become more. And this is what John the Baptist said, that I must decrease so he can increase. This is the posture of a student. To learn, we have to unlearn. We have to approach again the scriptures over and over again as though we've never looked at them before. We're looking again. And to properly learn. We have to eliminate the man-made filters that we have in our minds, in our eyes, in our ears, in our heart that are not sifting the word properly and creating blockages to our freedom. You have to exhale all the artificial life support that you've been joined to and have God now breathe in his spirit of life, his resurrection power through his own words his own understanding, his own interpretation of the meanings of the words that he gave to us, and so that we're living by the breath of the Word of God alone, not by man's words. And so then we also need to cut off all the man-made definitions and absorb back into our soul all of God's definitions 
What does he say is holy? What did he say was grace? What did he say is faith? What did he say is salvation? And we're absorbing back those and not creating our own cliches and living inside a world of cliches. His words are already packaged with their own commentary sets, which I've been showing you little bits here and there. I'll start to begin to show you more in the future um, of, of words. And I'm packaging them for you and teaching you how to do it in the future lessons. So you want to always measure up what your standard, what, what you're receiving as revelation. And you want it to always agree with God. Your definitions and God's definitions need to meet at the same place. Um, and you want to make sure you're joined and connected in the way to his word that he wants you to be, because he's got all of his words together, joined in in fellowship with each other through numbers, through combinations, which I've been showing you is how words inter intersect and link together in Hebrew. Again, you can Google this stuff and get access to all kinds of stuff for free. And there's, there's sites that I use that you don't have to learn a word of Hebrew. If you, if you feel intimidated by that, you don't feel like you could do that. You can do this in English and learn to do it slowly and uh, have people. There's, there's all kinds of tools out there for free. I can hook you up. Scripture interprets scripture. You must learn that scripture is meant to interpret scripture. It's written just so. Um, it's not a theology book. It's not a philosophical uh, 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 textbook. Um, you want to have scripture always interpret itself because the way that God wrote it, he is always explaining himself. He explains what he means. And he tells you what the definition uh, is of words. You've got to search for it. It's poetic. Uh, it's like Shakespeare a little bit. And this is why um, it's good to have teachers, because your teachers might know how to do this. So you learn to study God's Word so that it interprets itself. You don't need to have man interpreting it for you. You can, you can see that the way that these words work is that I've showed you, you know, how you put this letter and this letter and the word Israel and all that. You know at the end of it, it's already interpreted itself. So it brings peace to your soul. You can feel the way it breathes into you. Um, it breathes something into you. And the result is, is that your mind becomes clearer. You understand it. Even though we might not necessarily know at the beginning what does it look like to practically walk this out, that's the process of going up the mountain. So then you get the wisdom on how and the discernment to walk it out. But you have to learn it first. So words um, that are spoken by the divine breath, are always going to be the words of God. So they're always going to echo the truth of God. And they're going to join you to the Torah, and they're going to join you to the Spirit. They're going to do both simultaneously because one is the other. The Spirit of Truth is the Spirit of Holiness. They are one Spirit. So they're fellowshipping with Yeshua inside of you, and the Father is fellowshipping with Yeshua inside of you, and all of a sudden you have the dance. Father, Son, Holy Spirit happening around you every moment and every time you're engaging the scripture, it's just happening on a deeper level, um, layer by layer. They're faithful to carry out the process, but we have to trust that they're having fellowship together and that we're actually maturing in the process and we need to cut out the flesh and not worry about whether or not we're getting it, but letting the spirit um, lead the process. And our job is to make sure we're cutting the flesh off. And the Father uh, and Son and the Holy Spirit helps us do that. So you're learning to develop ears that hear what the Spirit is saying. And you're doing that by engaging the Word of God. It's opening up your ears as it cleanses your soul. It's like removing the blockages. Um, so you want to make sure that your measurement is the same. So here's some questions that I have to help you. We're almost done. You can hold on to something because someone trained you this way. This is, you know, what we all go through because it's like, well, someone I respected taught me this and we don't want to let it go. But the fact of the matter is that we have to always go back to the scriptures because that might be an old revelation. That might be the old field that we've got to come into the new boundaries of the shepherd's field. He's teaching us differently, instructing us differently. And it's not just honor to cancel out one. It's, it's the process of maturing and the fruit that comes out of that goes to the person who taught you um, because you've lifted it up another level. This is what Jesus did. So you can hold on to something because someone trained you this way, 
but you're assuming that they went up to the mountain themselves, that the shepherd's field is not expanding and God's not moving you into new territory or greater territory, expanding the territory. It also involves um, that you're assuming that the person you're receiving from isn't borrowing that from somebody else and giving it to you. And so you've got to make sure you get your own food, that you prepare your own meals and sit with God with your own uh, recipes. You need to uh, not always just take from the recipes of other people. Sometimes um, it's like going through a fast food line. Okay, I'm going to go to McDonald's lane and order a hamburger because I don't want to go home and cook for myself because I'm tired, right? Sometimes it's our attitude with the Word of God. We just put on a YouTube video. We just uh, listen to a, a, a sermon online when an actual fact is that God wants us to meet our eyes to his page so that he can reveal a mystery to us. It's not going to happen the same way uh, when you're, when you're not settling your spirit to sit, which is the concept of rest. Sometimes we're doing things in a busy state and we're just listening and not consuming and digesting what we're hearing. So we're actually blocking our ears from hearing more because we're filling our, our vessel up with all kinds of other stuff uh, that God can't join to because we're not able to digest it. We're just becoming obese in the spirit. So do you give, do they give you an idea when you're talking about teachers? Do they give you an idea, then use a verse to back up their idea? There's some people who teach that way. Or do they show you when God came up with that idea and how he explained it when he presented that idea to his prophet, his teachers, and his shepherds? God explains everything in a context. Um, it's one verse out of here to support one principle. That is not how God wrote his word. Um, it, you can do that when you're when in, in certain aspects, but you're actually uh, probably going to cause more error in your life than anything and deceive people because you're just taking it as a verse, applying your own opinion to how it is and ignoring how that verse was taught in Scripture. It was placed there intentionally, specifically in the way that it was. So he explains the context of how he wants something understood. This is how God did it. Do they provoke you to a godly jealousy? We want to be provoked. So you want people in your life that know more than you who provoke you, that make you feel uncomfortable and provoke you to jealousy to get in the Word of God uh, because that's actually the process God desires to happen when it comes to His Word. He actually um, rewards that. When you get jealous and provoked by the, the, the maturity in somebody else and it inspires you to go to the Word, there's a reward that comes with that process. And you can be a student of someone walking by their own understanding because you're just trusting what they're saying um, and not questioning it in yourself, like not questioning them, but understanding where it comes from in Scripture. And to profane the name of God is to take a Scripture out of context. So if you see people taking scripture out of context, sometimes you do have to correct it because they're, they're, they might not know they're taking God's name in vain by that thought process. And so by correcting it or adding support with truth to it, to balance it out, is very important because you're saving a person from falling into a trap, a snare that the enemy wants to trap them into to bring uh, trouble to their life. So this is part of the discipleship process. Are you using the same measurement as God to measure his word? And are the people that are teaching you and discipling you using the same measure as God? And is that alignment happening? That's very important to evaluate in your life. And we are at the end. <laughs>